Hello and welcome to this new episode of the JMDR podcast where we talk to high profile medical device experts and discuss topical issues that are important to the international medical device regulatory industry. Today, I welcome Cristina Murgeitio from the Association of Medical Device Importers and Distrib Distributors in Ecuador. Lovely seeing you, Cristina. How are you today? Thank you, Marina. We're well. Uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure for us to be sharing some time with you guys. The pleasure is ours. Before we start, please could you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the role of ACEDIM? Sure. Um, ACEDIM is the uh, Importers and Distributors of Medical Devices Association in Ecuador. Uh, it's very important to know to let you know that the 99% of the medical devices are imported to Ecuador. The production of medical devices is very minimal and also is just starting to develop in basic medical devices. And uh, after Dean was uh, founded in 1999, he has already 21 years of uh, working with uh, the health system in Ecuador, trying to improve the health system and the life of patients bringing uh, to Ecuador new, new options of treatments and medical devices. That's a little bit of the work that we do. We work very close with the government in order to have the correct public policy regarding medical devices and how to improve life for patients. Thank you for this introduction. So uh, my first question to you is um, one of many that our subscribers sent to us. We invited them to ask questions specific to Ecuador. And um, there were quite a few questions submitted, but we will try to get through as many as possible in the time we have uh, available. So sure. my first question, is Ecuador's medical device le leg legislation in accordance with the laws of, for instance, the USA or European Union? In particular, does Ecuador use the same definition of a medical device and accessory as any of the major markets? It's trying to uh, get aligned to international standards. Actually, we have a new regulation since 2017 that is, in, is putting in place all these criteria from IMDRF, trying to have all the global uh, alignments regarding medical devices in the country. Um, we do follow all, all, the, all the regulations of the biggest uh, agencies, regulatory agencies, FDA, CE. We are trying to uh, work with PAHO and WHO in order to follow up all these big agencies and to uh, try to get process aligned and do it faster in order to recognize these uh, registrations, they, these international regi registrations in our country. So we're getting a line. We're getting into this, this process. It has been a lot of work, but we are still developing. The medical devices regulation was not developed as well medicines. And that's a challenge for Acidim. And part of the work that we're doing is trying to show the government the experiences of, of other countries in order to learn from them and make our system better. Hmm. What are the classification rules for medical devices in Ecuador? Do all product classes need to be registered with the authority? The risk. The risk is basically is basically what is used. If you have a medical device that has the same risk and the same uh, intention of use, can be in one of the classifications. We have the four levels of risk. The number, the first one is when is uh, less invasive in the patient, and the fourth one is when is the most invasive in the patient. So those re need more requirements in order to be approved in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And do all of them need to be registered with the authority? Yes, they do. Since yes. 2017, all of them need to be registered in order to have a better control because we have a lot of falsifi uh, falsifying yes. and mm -hmm. also uh, counterfeiting. So there is very, very important for us to have this registration. We're trying to speed the process in order to recognize these, uh, these uh, registrations for countries that have higher standards in, in sanitary registration. But yes, since 2017, we need to have medical devices uh, registration to get into the country. Mm -hmm. And are some medical devices still considered to be pharmaceutical products in Ecuador? Is it possible to do anything to change the registration category of those medical devices? 
But the suggestions we have made to the authorities and also to the companies is if you know that the product is not a, is not a pharmaceutical product and is a medical device or is not a medical device and is not a pharmaceutical and has a special uh, treatment in other legislations, to, there is a process that you have to ask the authority if it's a medical device or needs or not a, a sanitary registration. In that process, the companies have to show the authority that the product is a different kind of product that doesn't need a sanitary registration as a medical device or, or a pharmaceutical product. Mm -hmm. So we encourage everybody to use the uh, legislation from other countries in order to uh, show the authority that we cannot uh, have this product going through the ruling if it doesn't fill out all the, all the requirements. I see. Um, is a local partner necessary to obtain medical device licenses and certificates in Ecuador? Yes, yes, you need a representation in the country. Uh, you have either a, di a distributor or you can have a directly representation in Ecuador, mm -hmm. but you need to fill, you need to comply with uh, our sanitary re uh, regulation, which the first one is that you need to be a pharmaceutical establishment certification, so you have to be locally approved and have uh, good practices of uh, manufacturing or a, or a, a good practices in, um, in logistics part. So mm -hmm. if you don't have those requirements, you are not supposed to be able to get a sanitary registration. Okay. And um, are other approvals such as the CE mark in Europe or the US 510K or the Canadian MDL helpful for speeding up the registration process in Ecuador? Yes, it does. It does. We have a, uh, we have we try we improved these a year ago in well two years ago in 2018. We have a speed process that allows you to get the sanitary registration in 30 days if you are bringing products that have been approved of a sanitary agencies of high level mm -hmm. that are recognized by the DRF. Mm -hmm. If they are in that category, they can be approved in, in 30 days. The only problem that we have right now is a level one and two risk are in that category. We're trying to work with the authority that a level th three and four can be in this process also, and we can speed up because there is a high volume of medical devices in these levels. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. have certification from CE or FDA, uh, ARSA, who is the sanitary regulation authority in Ecuador, cannot question so many things that FDA and CE because we haven't developed our laboratories in that way. So we are obligated to recognize the work that has been done and focus our control in the post control, post market uh, control is the most important with this kind of process. Mm -hmm. um, what are the official evaluation timeframes stated in the regulations and are these timeframes generally adhered to? If they are not, what would be what would you suggest is a more accurate reflection of the evaluation timeframes? Well, we we are trying to improve the process. Uh, we had some delays regarding the pandemic part, but it's still the the COVID the COVID products were approved very fast in approximately thirty days. The other ones were taking a little longer. Uh, if the process is, doesn't go with any issues, it could be approved between. Um, 100 and 120 days, approximately, the most at six months it is taking. The, the, the suggestions that we make to the companies all the time is that you need to have all the documentation in order to submit so you don't get delays as to the process in to, to fill out parts that the government is requesting you. Yes, because otherwise the documents are going forth and back and forth and back. And so exactly, and delaying. the government has been very very, very tolerable regarding this documentation that needs legalization, translations, and consularization that we couldn't do it during the, the COVID process because of all the of all the problems that we had around the world. But um, you can have a letter of compromise that you are gonna let them have the document as soon as things are getting well and you can get the document as soon as possible. 
When you say translation, you are referring to uh, translations into Spanish. Does the documentation yeah. have to be yes, in because Spanish? the official language in Ecuador is the Spanish, so whatever documentation, legal documentation that you need to present to the government has to be translated to Spanish. Okay, of course. And certified or apostolized. Mm -hmm. yes. Have you noticed an acceleration of the registration process for medical devices considered critical in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic? Or have there actually been delays to the process because of COVID? What is your experience? It has yeah. kept going, actually. It, ARCSA, it has been, ARCSA is an agency that was uh, created, I, I believe, six years ago, a little more, mm -hmm. and is in developing. But in comparison with other agencies and big agencies around Latin America, they keep working during pandemic during the COVID-19 and they still uh, approving the process. Ecuador was able to bring new products without problem in Ecuador. Hmm. As to the registration, the problem regarding the market and the, all the issues about uh, the demand of, of products around the world, of course, affect the, the, the purchase that the government need to make. But as to registrations, uh, we, were, we were keep complying last year and during this year. Mm -hmm. um, how much, this is a, a profane question, how much does it cost to register or re-register a medical device in Ecuador? The sanitary registration fee is around $940 approximately and to that you have to add all these calls about translations and all other requirements that you need to have ready to bring an imported product in Ecuador and um, at the moment, this uh, sanitary registration certificate is valid for five years. So you invest almost thousand dollars for five years. Okay. And the registration mm -hmm. and the renewal fee is almost the same. Mm -hmm. um, our subscribers were also wondering about um, the question, what do you consider to be the best points or advantages of the current regulatory system? And what areas do you think could benefit from improvement? Well, we will be, we have been working with the government regarding these new regulations. Um, and uh, I think the, the improvement we have made is try to have the government aligned to international standards. And uh, we, as a team, we are part of Altimed, who is the association of associations in Latin America. And we work very closely with Altimed and with uh, MedTech Europe too, regarding this alignment. Part of the strategy as associations is that we need to work with WHO and PAHO in order to align and understand and have the governments understand how the industry works. Because part of the problem that we have all the time is that they develop regulation for many things and they try to apply medicines regulation to medical devices when the industry is completely different. And you have to measure medical devices in a different way as to value base, uh, use, how do you improve better uh, quality of life for patients, the, the analysis that the government have to make as to how to purchase medical devices is completely different as to how they do it with medicines. And uh, the focus is the patient and that's what we're trying to work around the, all these associations around Latin America and around the world to focus the government in how we can improve the patient's quality of life. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think it's a big challenge. And after the pandemic, during, well, we're still in the pandemic, we can show, we can show that the health systems have not been able to respond and to give the treatment that the patients deserve. So I think it's a big, big challenge for the industry and the government to improve the health system and to understand that the public and the private sector need to work together in order to have a health system that can really respond to this horrible episode that we have as the world, but to think about what the patient needs individually. You cannot purchase everything for everybody. You have to think that every patient is different and every patient's needs is completely different and needs different treatments. So that's what we're trying to improve in Ecuador and also in the associations around Latin America. I think that's an observation that applies to many countries, what you just said, not only Ecuador, but it's something that 
Yes, yeah, Europe has a lot of advantage on it regarding Latin America, but Latin America is facing a really, really big issue regarding health systems. Ecuador, unfortunately, is one of the, of the countries that spend so much money in health system, and the answers that we're giving the patients are not the best ones. Hmm. We are wasting money, we're wasting resources that need to be readdressed. We are in a political change just this month, we, have, we will have a new president in uh, May 24th. Mm -hmm. And we're, what we're looking forward to it is to work with the new government in order to make a better public health public policy that is not only implemented in hospitals, it's implemented in basic resources like water, uh, sanitary resources for the population in order to have them better uh, health uh, and eating habits for the, for the children. Uh, address what the needs are for the senior citizens. We need to address all these issues in a big, big uh, view, not separately. It has to be very, very uh, integral and close to the human side of the bar, of the, of the system. Mm -hmm. Because we just think about money, we just think about uh, how to try to use more money in order to give more attention. But if you do not address how the quality of service is being done and if it's being effective you're spending more money but you're not getting the results that you want for the population there's a lot of work lying ahead for you i see yes it is but we are very very happy to achieve this challenge we think that we have improved a lot regarding medical devices uh, regulation in ecuador and that's the work that we are very happy to do every day and every day we have a new challenge because medical technology is, a, is being advanced every day hmm. and it has new challenges for everybody around the world. Yes. So I have one last question for you. Uh, do you think that in the future there may be a single entity in Latin America for registering medical products? So a single registration could be submitted to a single entity and the resulting registration certificate would be valid in all Latin America, Latin American countries? Do you think that's I think possible? possible? It is possible, but I don't know how practical it is because governments have their own sovereignty. And that's a big issue for a lot of countries. But we're working these new concepts about convergence and also reliance that we're working it, uh, with PACO and WHO as to how the authorities can rely in the work that other authorities have done. In this case, Ecuador can rely in uh, work that uh, sanitary agencies with high level uh, have been work on, and we can focus the work in trying to get more medical technology, new technology, and focusing post-market control. That's the way to apply the resources in the correct way. Because the governments in Latin America, what they are doing is actually really a documental re review of, of the process that the products did in, in their own countries or in, in Europe or in the United States. So we're wasting time doing review of documents when we can validate these recognitions of these sanitary registrations and we can focus our resources in uh, health market control in order to, uh, to make sure that the, that the products are complying with what they said they have been complying and also what is the impact in the population mm -hmm. as to it. So I think it could be a way because we are in, a glo in the globalization process. Yes. We all are working in clusters and we are all working in that way. But I think the recognition of other uh, decisions of other authorities that have higher levels of uh, assessment is the way that we have to go in order to improve the use of the resources that we do not have in Latin America, hmm. especially <laughs> because it's a continent that has a lot of countries that do not have enough resources in order to get agencies to develop like FDA or CE or hmm. EMA. We do not have those kind of resources and we have to rely on those decisions that are made by these organizations that have the resources and have the knowledge to do it. Hmm. So let's, so let's see, it's a big challenge for everybody, I think. Yeah. I think, but the way to go is to align everybody in order to apply this reliance and this convergence. Mm -hmm. The regulatory convergence is a big, big 
a goal for Latin America, and we are right now working with other associations as to how to get good regulatory practices in order to have the governments follow procedures that all the world is following regarding the creation of regulations for medical devices and for other, other matters. I mean, the pandemic has also shown that international cooperation is so important, isn't it? Transnational, exactly. transatlantic cooperations, and that's the future also of globalization partnerships. And that's the future, I think. I think that the way that we were thinking that we as a country can do everything alone, it's mm. out of uh, range at the moment because we cannot be by ourselves. You need mm. everybody to help you and you need to help everybody mm. around. So cooperation is it's indispensable because if you have the product, the vaccinations at the moment, you have some countries that produce that, but they are gonna have to give up some of the, of the rights. I was listening yesterday as to the patent the discussion and the world is dying. And if we do not do something about it, it's, but at the same time, we need to still having some diagnostic as to it because mm -hmm. vaccination doesn't mean a cure. And we have to keep diagnosing people and population all the time in order to have the pandemic under control. If not, we're not going to be able to do it, even if everybody is vaccinated. Yeah. So with cooperation between agencies, between governments, between industry, and that's the focus that as medical devices industry, we're doing it. We as a CDM are part of Aldimed, and also we, we joined the meetings that GMTA has that is very important. I think the most important thing that the uh, pandemic shown us was that the public sector, the governments need the private sector in order yes. to Definitely. function, in order to make the right decisions. So these, these not, a not adequate idea that the government is who rules and who can do everything is up is not updated anymore, I think. Mm -hmm. It's not the right way to go because the cooperation between public and private sector is indispensable in order to get the solutions that the governments need at the moment and the patients need. Thank you very much, Christina, uh, for your answers and your many insights. I am sure our audience learned a lot from you. I, I learned a lot, so thank you very much for that. Thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. It was a pleasure to share in some time with you guys. Thank you. The pleasure was all ours. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks.